with Daybreak on Raven Island, I wrote the book and, and you just don't know until it starts to go out into the world what the response is. Is it really scary? Is it not all that scary? What are people thinking? And, and from the early reports, people are genuinely spooked. So I'm like, okay, I did my job. Because <laughs> you don't know when you're building, particularly when it's a lot more about building the tension and building the mystery, because mystery is a lot like horror in the sense that um, you're, you are planting clues and you're building and you're building until the reveal. So horror is the building of, of what am I afraid of, the shadow in the corner, the darkness, the sounds, and then building until um, at some point you reveal what it really was that made those sounds and what the shadow was and um, where the ghost came from. So, um, you know, there's a skill set involved with that that's similar to mystery, um, but at the same time different because you don't know what, you know, what's going to scare uh, a young reader. So Daybreak on the Raven Island, definitely. Um, I, I, from what I've, I've heard, I've done my job. Um, and it's aimed at a little bit older of a reader than Midnight at the Barclay Hotel. So um, that works. You can do more uh, scary stuff, I think, at that level. I know Tori, Marvin, and, and Noah, they're all in seventh grade. So is that about where your ideal reader is or just under that? Who? What, what's the ideal age range? It's a little under that. Most kids for middle grade will read up. So I would say, you know, fourth, fifth, sixth um, are my my people, so to speak. Um, I think at seventh, you're you're uh, heading towards kids reading YA. Um, my it, not always. I mean, there's seventh, eighth that will still read middle grade, and it depends on your the level of your reader and what they're exposed to, what they're allowed to read. Um, but uh, yeah, seventh and up, I would say, are already starting to look more at YA or something like The Hunger Games. You know, a little bit um, popular sort of stuff. Yeah, no, depending on, on where in the country you are, the most exciting thing you may get to read is the Bible. And it's worth it because every every nasty, violent, terrible thing you could possibly want to read is in that book. So it, it's, it's, it's funny because people don't, you and I go back some um, to when I had my double vision books out, which is Spy, spy Kids sort of uh, stuff, but he gets hit on the head at some point and, and he, a gun is waved at him at some point in the story. And people don't really flinch at that stuff. It's, it's when it starts to get into, you know, uh, anything moral um, related that you start to get in, into banning books and, and, and things like that. It's, but at this rate, you know, who knows? Give it enough time, and 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 everything will become off limits. You're right. Then we'll be reading the Bible. I'm hoping. I see a lot of pushback. So, as much as it's it's terrible to see some of these reports of of books being banned and and all the lists, I see librarians pushing back. You know, like in Florida and in Texas, I see work that people are doing to actively uh, combat. Um, the banning of books and and it doesn't get talked about maybe enough you know that that there's it's not like um people can just magically go around and and are those banning banned books lists bad yes uh but i i'd like to focus on the people that are fighting a good fight rather than the people who are just so scared they're just scared and they they, they cling on to something and that becomes a banned book list um, but there's also a lot of people that are doing great stuff for our kids and, and are making sure that they do have access to the books that they really need. Yeah, I uh, tend to take, not take it for granted, but um, just accept that there's a certain type of adult that will always be and has always been around trying to ban books, burn books. And I don't know why that person is the way they are, but they're, they, they pretty consistently show up. <laughs> throughout, yeah. throughout history uh, and I, I have faith that you know another 20 30 years from now they'll be there uh they'll be trying to ban books and and, and some other things yeah. so i take it for granted but i do talk with enough authors that are fighting that fight and of course it is important to always take it crucially not take it for granted that just because we have won in the past we're going to continue to win and, and that lang literature is going to be widely and freely available absolutely i will say though like 
looking at my own kids, which are our young adults now, they're they're um, uh, 19 and 22. Um, that generation um, is is so admirable. You know, they're they're so much more progressive in their viewpoints. Um, they teach me so much um, when just listening to them and the way that they look at things and, and um, the level of access that they have, as much as the phones and everything gets bad rap, it also opens their world. So someone who lives in a small town in, say, where I live, Colorado, uh, can still have access to um, a world of cultural um, influences in a way. So their generation is different. I'm, I'm really hoping that we'll start to see more of this, um, um, see basically some of it change as generations shift, as my generation gets older and, and, and the younger people come up and hopefully they'll be more accepting and some things that, that are a conversation now or an argument now will stop being one at some point. That's that's my hope, but I know that that's, that's very uh, rainbow hopefulness. <laughs> Well, we could use a little rainbow hopefulness. Yes, now. exactly. That's why I write middle grade. I mean, it's what's more hopeful than writing for kids, really. Um, yeah. Well, the, um, yes, nothing more hopeful than writing for kids. But of course, you have chosen a genre that also um, there isn't there isn't any missing uh, a little bit of darkness here and there as you I mean there is a body <laughs> yes there is a body there is a body someone's dead I'm sorry <laughs> you know what though I write it as a cozy mystery in a way so for those people not familiar with that term it basically just means that the murder the terrible stuff happens off screen to an extent and that it's mostly about solving the puzzle rather than the the darkness of the death um, so it works well for middle grade and that worked well for midnight at the Barclay hotel as well. Cause that's a younger middle grade. I mean, there's second graders reading this and there's a murder in it. Um, but the murder doesn't happen on screen and that particular book in Raven Island, it does. Uh, and sometimes you have to push a little bit, I think, um, as far as when I started writing, um, these particular books, um, a librarian told me my kids want a murder mystery so because a lot of what existed and and still exists are mysteries surrounding a theft surrounding you know um something else mysterious with, with a puzzle to solve but it you know people were shying away from the murder mystery which i think with the right skills and the right writing is is perfectly doable in a kid's book i mean they they watch enough on tv and they see enough around them to to want that kind of those kinds of stakes basically um so that was really fun to try to um write a story that made it okay basically when i talked with um <clears throat> sarah pennypacker available in the back catalog of steamed audience check it out it's worth your time um we talked a bit about um, writing about war for children and about how there isn't, uh, you can't shelter children the, the same way you might have been able to shelter them when you and I were younger. Because mm -hmm. even if you take away all the cable television, all the, all the movies, you, you restrict that, sooner or later they're going to find access to the, the World Wide Web. They, they live in the information age. Anything yeah. you want to know is a Google search away. Mm -hmm. How does that, has that changed your approach for how you write for children? And what are some hard and fast rules you have for what's too dark and what's what's acceptable? Oh, well, that's an excellent question. You know, uh, when I, I do a lot of school visits, so then you get a, a great sort of um, benchmark as far as what the kids are exposed to, what they're watching, what they're, they're talking about. And it really ha isn't all that much different uh, from what and when I, even though you would think, things are different or is it different as far as the the information age and the access to the internet yes but what they're interested in what they're comfortable in with is still the same they will shelter themselves in a way from things they're not ready for and the things they don't understand like for instance uh, my double vision books um 
the first book is an, is is kind of uh, spy kids funny. The second book I really wanted to be an espionage espionage book. So it's set in Washington D.C. There's lots of complex uh, sort of spy stuff going on with double spies, and there were kids that that read or read the first book and had trouble with the second book because it was just too complicated and they had to put it aside. So that was a great learning experience for me to know. Okay, I have to mind what kids are ready for as they read and go on. And it isn't necessarily content. I mean, we talked about ban banning books, all that. Sometimes it's the complexity of a plot, particularly for mysteries, you have to make sure that you pace and that you reveal at a certain level and that you're very clear about what's going on. Um, in each of the books, I have sort of stop scenes where the kids go over what clues they have and what information they've recovered. Otherwise, the kids will get lost, particularly the younger ones, but sometimes even the older ones. Um, so, um, so yeah, that's kind of on the mystery side. And I, I went on a tangent and I forgot what your question was. <laughs> it wasn't as interesting as the answer. 